Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to A Word on Westerns, where today we have highlights from nine of our guests who joined us over the years. Now, all nine of these actors and actresses are over the age of 90. So we're going to see nine of them going all the way up to almost 100. We're going to start with the youngest, a mere 91 years old. If you're a regular subscriber, I know you've seen all of these interviews in their full length, but if you're not, you're going to get a nice taste of what it is that we do that we love so much, which is hearing about their stories behind the scenes, making westerns for television and in the movies. It's a lot of fun for us, and I think you're going to really enjoy what we're doing. It's exciting, so let's get right to it. So it premiered on a rotating basis. Clint Walker, big, sturdy, Cheyenne Bodie, and in the pilot was you. What do you remember about that? I was just so lucky to be in it. I, I remember that he was six foot six, <laughs> an enormous man, awfully sweet. I think, I think Clint Walker perhaps was the most decent man I have ever met because he made you remember that you were a lady and you never dared even say the word hell or damn, it would embarrass him. And he would look at you with, I'm so disappointed in you, I didn't expect that. <laughs> so I mean, he, he really, I, I admired that man so very much. And, and uh, uh, James Garner, I went to high school with him. He was about two or three years ahead of me at Hollywood High School when I entered in the 10th grade. I think he was graduating. And James Bumgarner. Yes, James Bumgarner. It was his first, his first screen kiss, and I think uh, he hadn't been in front of a camera that much either. Well, whatever happened, the camera loved him. Indeed. <laughs> indeed they did. He turned out to be a very successful actor. Well, and the show then that you were in just kicked off a, a huge success for ABC and Warner Brothers, and suddenly Warner Brothers was owning all the time slots on, on ABC with 77 Sunset Strip yes. and Surfside 6. And uh, you even came back and did another episode of Cheyenne. Yes, the second season. Mm -hmm. uh, second, I don't know, second season or year. I'd, it was quite a while later, though. You did a film with Alan Ladd, too, later in his career, yes, One Foot yes, in Hell. Yes. That was a vengeful movie as well. Yeah. Well, the interesting ex thing is that uh, I was hired to play the part that he, he played. Hmm. And they came to me one day and they said, uh, would you switch to play the, the drunk in the show uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then we can get Alan Ladd to, to play your part? And uh, I said, Shane, I said, that's terrific. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. So that's what we do. We, we switch our Wouldn't roles. that have been the time to say, no, I'm walking? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been, yes. So that, that, could, that, could, that could have been very well. But he, uh, he had a, a very serious drinking problem. And he uh, had a trick he used to do is that he'd have his stand in come out and, and hand him a glass, and he'd drink out of it, and uh, it said, water, he said, and we, he said, would you like some? And he'd, he'd give it to me to have a, a sip of, you know, just to prove it was water. And then he would be slipped a different cup, and it was not water. <laughs> <laughs> so I was playing a drunk, but it was pretty hard to compete with a real drunk. <laughs> So I'm wandering around, wandering around, nervous as hell, my first picture. I mean, this army of grips, hauling brutes and this and that, up to the, out, we were shooting on the outside of the ranch house. The, all, all this equipment, and I thought, oh man, they gotta be ready by now. So I started heading toward the location. And as I'm approaching it, there's Wayne, exercising his Appaloosa. He's backing it up. And he's looking right at me. Maybe I'm at the end of the theater here. And he's saying, where's that New York actor? Where's that New York actor? 
And I knew he meant me, and I'm looking right at him. And I said, you mean me? And he came and I'm, so I walked on past him to the set, and we began to work. Yeah, and that horse, that Appaloosa that he was riding, I don't think, from what I understand, Duke liked that horse. It seemed a little too small, but Hawks owned the horse. <laughs> <laughs> and so he wanted it in the film, and so he made Duke ride it. Was it was a pretty horse. Yeah. A pretty horse. Do you have a favorite? <laughs> Gunsmoke episode? Yes, I think the one I did with Steve Einett. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that, uh, you know, the thing about Gunsmoke, whoever wrote Gunsmoke, and there were a lot of writers, uh, they made women really good roles. Really, really fine roles and very good roles. And with that one with Steve, uh, because I had a feeling that went right through till the end. I know he's going to die one day, and I'm, all, I'm trying to keep him alive. And so it was that kind of a thing, you know, urging Matt Dillon to, to get him before he's killed. Mm -hmm. You know, get him, if he has to serve time, let him serve time, but let, keep him alive, you know. And that was, that was Great. It was rare for a show, a, a dramatic show like that, to have as a regular contributing writer uh, a woman. Kathleen Height yes. uh, wrote a lot of those yes. episodes with, like you're saying, very strong, strong female women. Yes. women. <laughs> I, it's, I have a very strange thing about Gunsmoke. Norman MacDonald, I got movie after picture after picture, Virginians. I, he would just send me a script. I never saw him. I never knew what he looked like. He would write me letters saying, I'm still in love with you. And I, <laughs> and I never, saw, I ne never saw him ever or talked to him or anything. And when, you know, it was just, he was kind of a figure that was not real. <laughs> he gave me a lot of jobs, that's all I can say. And, and the fact was that I never met him, I never knew him. So The Outlaws was, was really different at the time because all the other shows were about a hero and you followed the hero. This was, we were following the bad guys. It was the bad guys. It was, it was a pretty good old show. It was a, it was a little, well, they were all kind of corny in those days, but uh, we did the best we could with what we had. We had, Walter was just a kid then, 20 years old, I think, 19 or something. And uh, we had a lot of the old actors that I, I was a teenager during the 40s and 50s, and I'd seen a lot of these old actors at the movies and stuff, and now here I am on a TV show, and here come these folks through my show. And what a treat that was to see some of those old, uh, character actors that I admired and watched all those years as in, the, in the 40s and early 50s, and here they were. I'm working with them. Well, Barton McLean was uh, a regular that first season with you. He'd done all those Warner Brothers Bogart movies. What was he like? Barton was great, tough old guy. He he uh, he was the lead heavy over there at Warner's for years, and and he came to work for us as the governor, and uh, he got most of the money. <laughs> and, uh, he got my, fired though, and you stayed on the second he season. Got, well, I, he didn't want to come back for the second season, so they made me. I was a deputy the first year. Second year, I was uh, I was the marshal. Well, you mentioned the older actors who were involved in that show, but what was interesting, looking back at them now, yeah. is the the group of young people that were coming up who guest starred in them. Oh, I know. Man. Uh, Jack Lord and Warren Oates and uh, Robert Culp, all these uh, terrific actors uh, were guest stars and bad guys in your oh, show. Yeah. Uh, who was the guy on uh, Star Trek? William Shatner. Bill Shatner, yeah. He, he did two of our shows back in those days. Mm -hmm. Shatner couldn't ride very well, but he was game for anything. And we had, a, we had a shot one day where me and Slim got the bad guys with guns on them. We're holding them for this. Sheriff coming in from out of town, and the camera's on top of a building, and it's going to catch the sheriff is, is Bill Shatner. 
and the camera's going to catch Bill riding in from this end of the street all the way up where we are over here with the bad guys. And the camera's up high, and the director's, now Billy says, come on in fast. He says, he says, you want this bad guy they've got. You want him to get him real quick. So the camera's up there, me and Slim are down there with the bad guys, and he says, action. And here come old Bill. I mean, he's, he's balls out across there, just <laughs> giving it all he could do, you know. And uh, he got pretty close to it. He's still going fast. And he, he throws his foot off, and, and his other foot got hung up, and he landed on the ground like this, and he's sliding, and as he slid, he pulled out his gun, and he got up where he just says, okay, I'll take him from here, boys. <laughs> <laughs> And the Lone Ranger appeared on Happy Days, too, but it wasn't Clayton Moore, it was John Hart. No, no. We, we were very disappointed that we yeah. couldn't get him. But I was so thrilled to be on The Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a... And the fact that he pers kept continuing that persona, how wonderful. You know, it's like the Fonz, at a certain point, didn't want to be the Fonz. Mm -hmm. And he tried everything to break, break himself from it. Now he's gone back to it again. See, Clayton Moore was so smart in building a lifetime character. Mm -hmm. What is it about the character of the Lone Ranger, you think, that has made it so lasting? Uh, he, he was so honest. You trusted him. Was, there was no falsehood anywhere. It's just straight ahead. Straight ahead. So you couldn't, see enough, you couldn't see a flaw. You didn't care that he was terribly human. He, he didn't have to show that side of him mm -hmm. because he was, he was perfect. I mean, here you've got Superman. He was another kind of Superman. Oh, Lone Ranger. Oh, oh, oh. Who was that masked man? And I never got to thank him. I was very good at doing all that. I could play French, Italian, Indians. <laughs> I, I did all of the ethnic roles. Shotgun Slade, there's another one with Shotgun, Scott Brady. No, that reminds me. Shot, I did unbelievable amount of fight scenes. And the best one was Scott Brady. Oh, I, yeah, I had a big one with him. Oh, I, I played such evil people, and that was a, probably the most evil character I've ever played, was that one. Uh, he, it, was all, it was called The Ring, and it was about, once the detective, Scott Brady, saw the ring, he'd know who the killer was. And it was uh, given to my fiance, Bethel Leslie, wonderful actress. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, we promised never to wear it, not for a long time, because it, it would condemn me. So uh, we have this meeting, me and Bethel Leslie, in the woods, wherever we were, and she's wearing it. And I was in shock, and I read her out. I was so angry. And she said that she, she wore it because she was in love and all that sort of stuff. And I got so angry, I, <laughs> I strangled her to death. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a bad guy then. <laughs> I picked her up and threw her over the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> and toward the end, of course, Scott Brady finds me. We have this gigantic fight. Then I run off, and of course, he gets his rifle, and I'm gone. <laughs> On The Virginian, the Belgium. first 90-minute Western, yeah. and yeah. you must have had a great time working with all those guys, with Jim Drury, Doug McClure, what was that like? They were terrible. Ah. Actually. <laughs> uh, it was great because it was the only show for a long time that was more than 30 minutes. Then it was more than one hour. Uh, think of that. Uh, a motion picture, let's see, I've done, they tell me 100, 
and 13 pictures. Uh, the average being what? Uh, 50 minutes, 60 minutes, maybe a little bit more. We had to turn out one of those every week for the Virginia. There was no expansion of days. It didn't take six or seven, eight days to shoot that because- today, You shot all the time. Yeah. Uh, you don't know whether you're doing one, two, three, four shows simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you're doing a bit here and something there, a, a, a line from this one. Uh, but the characters were so well established that it was pretty easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but Jimmy, Jane, pardon me, uh, the, the rest of the cast, superb people. Uh, Lee J. Cobb, you ever heard the name? <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. The first time I was going to work with Lee G., I was petrified. I was wetting my pants, for Christ's sake. Look at this face on Lee J. Cobb. And I'm saying, God, how do you stay alive? The talent, the ability. Okay. Here's to it. Suicide. Here we come. <laughs> After the first show, they would never let both of us in the same cast. Lee J. was the funniest man that ever walked on two feet, and it was hysterical to go to work with him. But we made so much noise <laughs> laughing about the script and everything else, we couldn't work together. We never got to, the, the show was finished. Uh, you know, and it's, it's so much fun when you're working. Even if you're not good, it's so much fun. <laughs> Why are you laughing? No, it's, it's, Dear Gussie, they seem to like the movies I make. Well, I like the movies Gene Autry makes, and I want to make a movie with him. He said, good grief, that would be box office dynamite. I thought, whoopee, we got, got a good thing going. I said, okay, what do we do to make it happen? He said, well, number one, of course, we couldn't possibly let you go to Republic. I said, why not? I've never been to any other studio, and I'm still under contract to Fox, but people borrow other stars all the time. He said, yes, but you're sixth in box office of all the stars in the world. Gene is number one at Republic, and he said, I know that Republic would never let him come to 20th Century Fox. I said, Mr. Skink, you haven't asked yet. And I said, I won't take that for a, for a no, because I'm a very positive thinking lady. And I just think this is possible, and I think we can make a lot of people happy by doing this movie together. Long story short. We cut to Mr. Uh, uh, at Republic. Yates. Yates, Mr. thank you. Mr. Herbert Yates. I called the, at, at the studio and I said, who runs your outfit here? <laughs> and they said, well, uh, uh, you, you mean the CEO? I said, Whoever runs your outfit, who's the head man? I want to talk to him and nobody else. They said, uh, well, a little girl, a lot of people would like to talk to him. He's very, very busy. I said, lady, you should see my schedule. <laughs> Back to Mr. Yates's office. I said, Mr. Yates, I'll come right to the point. I know we're both busy. I want to make a film with Gene Autry. He said, ooh, that would be box office dynamite. I said, thank you, God, again. <laughs> so anyway, long story short, we talked a bit. He said, well, of course, Fox would never let us borrow you. I said, I've been through that with Mr. Skink, sir. But I have an idea. You know, we've got some wonderful leading ladies at Fox. And why couldn't we trade three or four of those leading ladies for one Gene Autry, and maybe Gene could come to Fox to my studio. He said, hey, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> anyway, it worked. Thank you, God. It took about nine months to make it happen, but I tell you, one of the happiest days in my life was when they called me and said, okay, Jeannie, your wish is coming true. You're going to make a picture with Gene Autry, and oh, poo, I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> but it just goes to prove to you, if any of you have a dream, don't you ever give up on it, ever. Because it's in your heart. It is. It's important. Hi, it's me again. I'm back. And guess what? I have a surprise. We have one more person who's the oldest, 97 years old. It's Ray Boyle. So here's some highlights from an interview we did with Ray. And I did a tremendous amount of research. I started out doing it to feel what my part was as Morgan Earp as far as the series was concerned. Hank Clanton's back in town this morning. 
Cold Silver. Still making fight talk. He says the McLowry's and several other guns are on their way into town. So in doing that research, I fell in love with his family. In other words, he was sixth generation, sixth generation American. His father fought in two battles. His grandfather was a judge and an attorney. In fact, Wyatt was supposed to, in his training, take over his grandfather's business. But they decided when they were leaving from Pella, Iowa, to California, he took a big group of people, and all there was about 40 people from the city when he was, they knew he was coming to California, wanted to join the wagon train. He was only six, Dwight was only 16 years old at this particular time. But he could outshoot with any gun, his peers, or, you know, the, 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 the older people. It was a matter where, uh, where he drove first wagon behind his dad, and at that particular time, when he went on this wagon train, he fell in love with the outside and he did not want to go back to the studies to take over his grandfather's business. There's a tremendous story as far as his moving from, from those days into what he became. This has been a really big celebration, one that has been a long time coming. I hope you enjoyed it and that we see you next time here on A Word on Westerns.